Welcome to New York City and Mission City Church. We're here to connect people with God and with each other. We hope you're encouraged by this week's message. James 1, 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What a gift to gather like it always is. Um, great to have you with us one more time. If we didn't meet earlier, I'm Garrett and I serve as pastor here. And it uh, often falls to me to have the privilege to open the scriptures together during this uh, kind of heart of our gathering here. And uh, I'm grateful to get to do it. My life was interrupted by the grace of God um, over a decade ago. That's why I'm here. Um, I'm a product of his grace, his kindness, his forgiveness. He interrupted my addictions and my uh, sin patterns and just all the things I was stuck in living for myself. And it wasn't an overnight transformation by any means. It was more of a process than an event. But looking back, I can tell you with certainty that God interrupted my life and I've never known a joy quite like following him. So that's, uh, that's why we are here today, um, at least speaking for me personally. Whatever your connection to Jesus is or lack thereof, I'm just glad that either worship drew you in the building or curiosity, I don't know, maybe even a little tradition. I, I have no idea what drew you in today, but whatever it is, I'm glad you found your way in. Jesus had brothers. We'll start there. I don't know if you knew that, but Jesus actually had earthly brothers, like blood kin. And we hear about them for the first time in an indirect way through the voice of a person mocking Jesus. It goes like this. Is this not the carpenter's son? This is, you know, some voice from the crowd talking about Jesus. Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James? We'll be hanging out with him for the next several weeks as he wrote a letter of the New Testament we're about to be studying for a while. His, are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? What's happening here is this is a voice of unbelief because a person, you know, Jesus is claiming and presenting himself as the son of God and someone's saying like, wait, wait, son of God? I mean, his mom's right over there. This is a normal guy, you know, so this is the voice of critique and his brothers are over there too and they're definitely normal, so Jesus has got to be normal. So this is the voice of unbelief that a person is announcing um, and it's the first mention we get of some brothers by name and James is one of them. The next time we hear about these brothers is we find out something about them a little more biographically. They do not believe in Jesus either, at least not in the Son of God. I mean, they know they have a brother, but they don't at first believe in him either. So check this out. So his brothers said to him, this is more mockery, this time straight from them, leave here and go to Judea. That's a more important province of the place. They were from a less important province of the place. Leave here and go to Judea that your disciples may also see the works you are doing. Jesus was kind of making a scene with his claims and attracting a following. And his brothers say, for no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. In other words, his own brothers come up to him and are like, you know what? If you're so big time, why don't you go to the big city and see what they say about you there? Knowing that this would lead to trouble for Jesus. So this is a critique. But then Jesus lives ministers in the public eye for another couple of years. He's executed by the Roman state and then is resurrected. That would be the basis of the whole Christian faith right there. And the resurrected Jesus, we're told, made a particular visit to one of his brothers. Don't know why, but this is what the text says. This is now the post-resurrection Jesus. Then he, that would be Jesus, appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. So more than 500 people most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. This will tell you, this can't be a legend because legends take like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years to like accrue and to build. Um, but this, this is the Apostle Paul writing, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, saying, if you want to go talk to some people who talk to the resurrected Jesus, they live on that street. You know, like go check them out. It's very concrete. It's very realistic. And it says, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, Then Jesus appeared to James, specific, and then to all the apostles. So it's very clear in the biblical text that Jesus actually appeared to, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to his unbelieving brother, James. And then to all the apostles. Some people have wondered, wait, how do we know that this is 
the brother James and not the apostle James. Well, it says to James and then to all the apostles. If this was the apostle James, he would have been included in the latter group. So this is a different, uh, this is a different James than James the uh, disciple or the apostle. This is his brother. And then an interesting turn again in James's life. The next time he pops up, he is a church leader. He has given himself to the movement, to the Jesus movement, to the movement of his brother that he formerly mocked. And the reason we know that is because there's a couple of lists in uh, in the New Testament that in an offhanded way mention people who were kind of in an authoritative meeting, you know, leadership meeting kind of a thing. And James's name is on the meeting roster, in the meeting minutes. So here's Acts 21, 18. On the following day, Paul, that would be an early Christian apostle, leader. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and to all the elders who were present. So the idea here is they're, they're naming who was present at an important meeting. And uh, you know that because nobody would say Paul, the apostle, who wrote like half the New Testament, and then the elders, who was the decision-making body of the church, and they wouldn't just randomly name, you know, here's James, the bystander in the back row. The idea is by association here, he was kind of a player in the discussion. He'd become a church leader. It happens again in Galatians chapter 2. I'll pick this up mid-sentence because we're not going into all the context. It just says, and when James and Cephas and John who seemed to be pillars, meaning James was a pillar of the church community. So at first, we see James, the brother of Jesus, watching as other people mock him. And then we hear the voice of James, mock him, if you're so big time, why don't you go down to Jerusalem and see what they think about you there? And then we see Jesus revealing himself as the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected son of God, revealing himself to James. And then boom, we have James, the church leader who anchored early Christianity in the region. That's quite a transformation. In fact, one commentator kind of summed it up this way. This is not a Bible text I'm about to read. This is a commentator kind of putting the pieces together. Although not a believer in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry, James became a part of the infant community, the early Christian community, presumably after seeing his brother as the risen Lord, which I'm not going to lie. That's what it would take for me. If you want, to, if you want an early Christian apologetic and you're just like, like why, another reason, like why would we believe in this? What would your brother have to do to convince you he's God? Like, what would your brother have to do, I mean, really, to convince you that he is the chosen one of God, okay? For me, I would need a resurrection, okay? Because I love my brother. He's a grand human. But, I, but I'm just telling you, we're not going to convince each other of anything unless somebody dies and then walks the planet again. That's what's going to be required. After seeing his brother as the risen Lord, James was a person of considerable stature in early Jewish Christianity and a leader whose authority Paul and Peter were unable to ignore. This is the biography of James that we get from the New Testament. And he, inspired by God, is the author of a book called James. It's really a letter. We tend to call them books of the New Testament. It's really just a letter that he wrote to an early Christian church. This might be the earliest letter we have in the entire New Testament. This could have been written in the 40s AD. So this is a very, very early Reaction to the events that we just described in Jesus' life. We named this series, we're going into like a collection of messages. We're going to study the book of James, like kind of one verse at a time, it's kind of our style. And we'll do that for as many weeks as it takes. Could be 10, could be 12, probably not all the way to next year. But for a few months here, we're going to look closely at the book of James and everything that he has to say. We subtitled this A Faith for Doers. A Faith for Doers. And here's why. If you have never read the book of James, or if you've read it 100 times, the same thing is going to pop out to you. This is a very practical, pragmatic book that is interested in the doing, you know? That would be the opposite of like theorizing or philosophizing. So there's a place for that to be clear. Like there's lots of, you know, theologizing and deep stuff in the Bible that makes our, that kind of blows our minds and that kind of a thing. But this book is not that. This book is not abstract, it is concrete. It's let's get down to business. Somebody has probably counted how many imperatives there are in this letter. It's like do, 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 do. It is so much do. So if you're that person who is like, this is good news for you. If you're that person who's like, uh, I don't have any time to waste. Just give me the summary. Give me the 30,000 foot view and let's get after it. You know, we don't have time for all this. We need to get down to business, whatever. If that's you, you and James are going to get along great because he is assuming you want to do something and that you don't have time to philosophize all day. Okay, so you, the commands are going to come early and they're going to come off and he is very much interested in the doing kind of a vibe. So that's the nature of the book. Now, having intro the whole collection, just to intro what we're going to do for the rest of today, this first little section begins on kind of a somber note that we probably wouldn't choose. Um, the topic is uh, suffering. So now you, um, 
probably would have picked, not what I would have picked. But I think his early readers probably didn't have an option except to pick it uh, because they were surrounded by some of the same people who sought to put Jesus, their leader, to death, were still kind of alive and on the hunt, if you know what I mean. So there was the possibility of suffering at every turn. So suffering is where he begins. He, he, he jumps right in um, to the idea of suffering. And before we hear his words, I want to say this is something that we can't really avoid either. Suffering is a part of human reality. I don't know anybody, unless someone is very mentally ill, I don't know anybody who likes or wants suffering. It breaks our heart. It stretches our faith when we suffer or when we see the helpless suffer in any regard. Suffering is all around us. Like if you wanted to zoom out at a world scale, some of the sharpest images of, of suffering in the present moment are coming to us from the very land actually where this letter was written from because in October there was an attack upon the nation of Israel that led to a lot of suffering. And then a responsive set of attacks that have led to, numerically at least, even more suffering. And human suffering is human suffering is human suffering. It's all completely and utterly heartbreaking. Whatever your geopolitics are, suffering is heartbreaking. And God is the God of all the, of, of all the world and all the universe. And so there is no suffering of which he does not take note. And I believe when our heart takes note, we're actually mimicking him because he has a heart to care. And so when we care and we have a reaction that, that shows our care, we're mimicking God who cares about suffering. But here's the thing. We don't even have to search that far. We don't have to go to the you know, global, big, bad, controversial news. We can just look in our own city. There's suffering sometimes that is visible even on the very sidewalks as people struggle along. There is so much suffering in this world. And then we can look in our own lives. We can... We can talk about a time when our own family went through suffering. It's just one of those realities that we don't want to say yes to. And, you know, when the vibes are good, we'd rather not bring it up. But the truth is suffering is a part of human life. So what is a Christian understanding of it? I mean, are we supposed to like avoid it, prayer, dodge it, hate it, condemn it, like some find some weird way to embrace it? Like what is a Christian response to suffering? And that's the concept that James is going to dive in on. So no more ado. Here we go. James, that's the first word of the letter. So back then, we did the to so-and-so, from so-and-so thing. For them, it's reversed, and you just don't even say from. You're just like, bloop, it's me. So anyway, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to, so they do it backwards, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. That means uh, the people of God that are scattered around the world. And when he identifies himself in greetings, I don't want to leave out his greetings, greetings. Um, he says, when, it, when he drops his name, I want to go on his biography one more time as it relates to suffering before we move on here. Even, James, even the rest of James's bio, biographical life is a tale of suffering because did you know that James actually died for his faith in his brother? So he went all the way from mocking to actually being killed for his faith. Now, the Bible actually doesn't record that event, but... There are history books, of course, that can be reliable, though not inspired by God and not necessarily a biblical book. There can be very old history books that are quite reliable. And one of the, uh, the best history books we have is uh, from a man named Flavius Josephus. Put that on the baby list name. If you're looking for a baby name, Flavius Josephus, put that out there. Okay, so Flavius Josephus writes this, and he's been proven accurate time and time and time again. And he says this. This younger Ananus, and, uh, who, as we have told you already, took the high priesthood, so the high priesthood would be the body of like legal and religious authority that put Jesus to death, okay? And this is just a few years after they had put Jesus to death. So this new boss man comes in, and it says he was, bold, he was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. That's a bad trait of a leader. He was also of the sect of the Sadducees, who are very rigid in judging offenders. So he assembled the Sanhedrin, or Council of Judges. It's the very same people that conspired to put Jesus to death. And brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them, it's interesting how they had to form the accusation. It wasn't obvious. Just like with the trial of Jesus, they had to fabricate something, right? But when they had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. That means large rocks dropped on James until dead. So that was a common way to be put to death for this kind of a thing. So James, the letter writer, actually suffered. And that um, su is surprising to some degree. I don't know about you, but I might have thought that um, James would get a pass. 
You know, he seems close enough to the key events. Couldn't we have had more letters from James? I mean, this is a pretty good one. I mean, it would have been good to like maybe let him run a little longer, you know. And he had, he had influence. And scholars even agree from a literary perspective. This is a well-written thing. You know, this is like a nice, nice piece of writing here, literature-wise. I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of, not to mention, you know, being the blood brother of Jesus. You would think, like, maybe if you're going to jump in with this, you, you could get a pass. But James doesn't get a pass. And what that means is if suffering can find James, the unsettling fact is suffering can find you and I. So just be aware of this as an intro, and this will be enough. Suffering can find you. Suffering can find you. If it can find James, it can find you. And why would you, some of you are like, I thought pastors were supposed to be encouragers. Like, what is the angle here? Well, I'm going to tell you what the angle is. The angle is you don't want to be surprised by suffering. I'm trying to help you avoid the shock and the surprise that life can be hard for Christians too. Suffering can find you. It's possible. I have a, um, a friend who was well, kind of a friend and mentor at the same time. He's 10 or 15 years older than me. Um, and his uh, son, who's now healthy and um, I believe a teenager at this point, when his son was about four or five years old, his son got a, got a very uh, a rare and very dangerous form of cancer, four or five years old. And um, they went through the whole process of all this, all of the medical visits, all of the emotional terror and just the fear and the desperate prayers and the, 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 probably the money situation, too, of just being in and out of hospitals. It is an ordeal. And they're going into this not knowing that it ends well, right? They don't know that at the time. And so what my friend and mentor and pastor has uh, often says when he tells this story, he always includes this line every time. And he says, you don't want to be figuring out your theology of suffering while you're already on the way to the children's hospital. Like, you don't want to be having to figure it out the day disaster has struck. You kind of want to think about this in advance. You know what I mean? So, and I believe that's true, by the way. And that's why if you're having a great day, I, you're going to get to resume that great day in just a moment. But I just want you to not be surprised if suffering ever interrupts your, your good day or your good season or your, your, your happy era or whatever, okay? Because suffering is a real and legitimate possibility in the worst kinds of ways, and it is just possible. And there's something in us that recoils against that because we don't want it. And then also there's a particular problem in that, and this is so confusing, there are many Christian, Christian pastors and churches and movements and ministries who are sending the messaging of the exact opposite of what I'm saying. That maybe if you pray right or hard enough, that you can avoid suffering and it won't find you, you know? Or if you can live holy or obedient, these are myths, by the way, don't write this down. So like, or if you, if you do write and you're like obedient and holy and, you know, I don't know, stop sleeping around or, you know, give money, that means to them, in case you're wondering, that's what they have in mind. If you give money to them, they'll make, you, they'll make this promise that maybe you'll stop suffering or something, you know what I mean? And it's every myth we can think of constructed just to find a way to make ourselves feel safe from suffering. Because who doesn't want to be safe from suffering? I want to be safe from suffering, don't you? Of course. But the truth is, when you look at this roster of people who suffered, okay, so Jesus, Jesus' brothers, Jesus' followers, Jesus' friends, Paul, his servant in the first century, they all have a, have a habit of, like, a conspicuous habit of dying, okay, for their faith. So the suffering seems to be baked in, and let's talk about the New Testament. Through much suffering, we must enter the kingdom of God, okay? Like, there's so many, it's, it's just explicitly clear. So I want to tell you, just, if you ever hear a Christian source out here promising that if you believe, give, obey, or whatever, you can be safe from suffering. Let me tell you what that is. That is not Christianity talking. That is Americanism, power of positive thinking-ism, capitalism, and my money will make me safe-ism. In a blender, frappe, drink. That's what they're doing, okay? That's what that is. And then they're just, they're just regurgitating that to you. And you don't want any of it because it's not real. I had the favor of, and I, and I say this meaningfully, I had the favor of having to face suffering early in my Christian journey. So in other words, that bubble of illusion popped pretty fast for me. When I was 19, I first started to put one foot in front of the other and actually follow God. I was not living well. I was not living well. No detours. We'll I'll share my testimony more fully another day. But I was not living well. And then as soon as I start to turn towards God, at the same time, my mom gets cancer and promptly dies. 
Like, whoa, hold on. If this was like a give and get kind of a thing, I'm trying to actually follow God now for the first time, and then my mom gets cancer. What kind of a deal is that? The answer is God never made a deal that when we follow him, we will be spared the suffering of this world. He just never made that deal. And if you think God made a deal he never made, you're going to be very upset when the bubble bursts. And I would spare you that. Here's here's one of the most common examples ever. And I'm telling you, this is where people in their 20s and 30s with their beliefs sow the seeds of their future faith crisis, which I'm trying to help you prevent right now. So here's a proverb, Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Again, train up a child. So this is a parent's verse. Parents latch onto this, like, boom, ooh, I need that one, okay? Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. Okay, that is a general, true statement. Proverbs are like aphorisms. They're accurate generalizations about how the world generally works. But they're not airtight if-thens. Let me give you an example of how that works. If you drive 100 miles an hour down Flatbush, you will get a ticket. Okay, you will get it, you, you, or you may go to jail. I don't know, but if you drive 100 miles an hour down Flatbush, you will get a ticket. True enough as a proverb. Now, there's always a, an exception, right? Somebody, some fool out there is probably, you know, like, I, watch me. Like, I will get to the Manhattan Bridge before they get me or whatever, you know. And so, but here's the thing. Could there be some weird exception? Yes, I'm giving you a general principle. If you drive 100 miles an hour on Flatbush, you will get a ticket. That's the difference between a proverb and a promise. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so let's go back to Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Okay, generally speaking, that's how it works. So train up a child in the way they should go. However, it doesn't forbid the possibility of a, like a prodigal son or daughter who abandons their faith of their Christian parents. If you don't know how to make that distinction, what's going to happen? You're going to turn 60 years old, and if you have a prodigal child who never comes back home, you're going to think God broke a deal that he never made. And your faith is going to explode because you're going to have thought that God made a deal that he never made. And the way you avoid that future crisis is you start with the unsettling reality of stripping away some myths and realizing I'm not going to hold God to something, to a deal he never made. And now listen, here's what this does. If you strip away what you thought God had promised, it makes what he actually promised that much better. That's what starts to happen. I know and there's like a moment of loss of security whenever you're like, oh, God didn't promise certain things that I really wish he promised. Like God did not, for instance, promise that um, we would live long lives. He did not promise that it would be easy to get married. He did not promise it would be easy to stay married. He didn't promise it would be easy to get pregnant or stay pregnant. He didn't promise it would be easy to make friends. He didn't, there, he didn't promise our physical bodies will, will not let us down. Like there's, he didn't promise the government wouldn't let us down. He didn't promise us immunity from the social ills of this world. Like there's so many promises he did not make. And if you strip all that away, it's unpleasant. But what happens is the real promises, they look that much firmer and more precious. Like I will never leave you or forsake you. Like all things work together for good. Like he will conform us to his image. Like he's transforming us from one degree of glory to the next. Like the good work he began in us, he will bring to completion. You know, all of a sudden, the real things that he's actually doing, the real promises he's actually made, turn out to be quite precious. So to wrap up this first point, are you aware of the possibility of suffering? Are you aware of it? Because if you're not, you're going to struggle. So ask yourself, do I think that suffering can really come to me or not? Just check, on, just check in on that. All right, let's move on. Here comes James. Count it all joy, my brothers. That's the Greek word, adelphoi. It also means siblings. So this is brothers, brothers and sisters. Both is the same word for both. He knows he's talking to the entire church. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith, when you see trials, think suffering. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Okay, what kind of suffering does he have in mind? He says of various kinds. And James goes on to name a few. So here's a preview of the rest of the letter. Like what kind of suffering does he have in mind? Well, there's stresses connected to economic poverty, favoritism for the wealthy and against the poor, economic abuse and injustice, blasphemy of Jesus Christ by those who have enough political power to get away with it, and economic exploitation of the poor by the rich. And there's verse citations in my notes for each one of those. So James is concerned about a very, he has a social focus 
in, uh, in some of the kinds of trials and persecutions and pains and sufferings that he has in mind. But it also says trials of various kinds. So that would mean everything from persecution for faith to just having a toothache, like the normal human stuff. Trials of various kinds. So that's a very broad thing. And the center of the command is to consider it joy. Now, if you're reading closely, you can't but ask, how do you do that? Like, you can't avoid asking that question. <clears throat> consider it joy when you face trials. That's like, consider it dry when you get in water. Like, I mean, the, these feel like opposites, like thoroughly opposites. Consider it joy when you face trials. Like, we typically would consider a trial or a suffering a joy sucker, not a joy provider. And so considering it joy when you suffer has got to, there's got to be something wrapped up in the verb. There's got to be something about considering, right? And it turns out that in the New Testament, considering is a common verb that's used for some really important changes of perspective. So Paul, for instance, urged believers to consider others better than oneself. It says elsewhere that Christ did not consider equality with God, something to be grasped, but surrendered for the redemption of others. Abraham considered God faithful and powerful enough to enable Sarah to conceive. Moses considered suffering for Christ more valuable than the treasures of Egypt. Peter wanted his readers to consider, 2 Peter 3.15, to consider the patience of the Lord. In other words, and we'll borrow from a commentator here, to consider trials as an occasion of joy involves an act of faith. For instead of looking at the trial like a wall, we're looking through the trial like a window to its potential outcome. So the reason, if you're stuck on like, how can suffering be a joy? Not for what it itself is, but for what it can produce once it's had its effect. That's where the joy lies. Not in the suffering itself, but in what it can provide. Let's summarize it this way. Suffering can serve you. Suffering can serve you. Not perhaps on the surface, not perhaps in its most immediate, obvious senses that cause pain. But under the surface somewhere, suffering can serve you. I know this feels like a Mr. Miyagi move. Do you guys remember the movie The Karate Kid back in the day? Some of you have only seen the new one. Um, but there's a, the Mr. Miyagi move is, you know, we're trying to learn karate here. And he says what? Wax on, wax off. You're like, what does this have to do with anything? Like, this is suffering. My arms are tired. My shoulders are tired. Why am I cleaning 100 cars? You know, this kind of a thing. But then, of course, you can block and parry other people's punches, and all of a sudden, your arms are used to doing something. So the Mr. Miyagi move is where you think you're training for one thing, but then all the while, it's producing an effect in you. So <clears throat> suffering is Mr. Miyagi. I'm just kidding. So the, the idea here is <clears throat> that suffering is doing more for you than you can immediately feel. Suffering is doing more for you than you can immediately feel. Always, always, always. And that is the way it serves you. And James is more specific. It says steadfastness is what it produces. There's a certain steadiness that suffering can produce. Moral character formation in you in the form of steadiness is what it has a habit of producing. And that's true. You ever th like think about the people you know. And think about the quality of like how steady someone is. Like they're just immovable. Their life is not a crazy roller coaster of ups and downs. They're just kind of steady. And then think about people who are kind of like, ah, oh, you don't really know what they're going to do next. You know, they're kind of on a joy ride and kind of swerving all over the place. I bet there's a correlation between suffering sometimes. Like there's just this sense in which there's a maturity that comes off of someone who has suffered. There's a weightiness of character when you can tell somebody's been through a lot. You know, I once sat with uh, at a, like a pastor's breakfast, and uh, it was two old friends who hadn't seen each other in like 30 years. They were like 60, and I was like 25, 28 rather. And I like sit down, and I'm like watching them reconnect, and they like looked at each other, and they shared this look that was like, I'm tired. <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, somebody said like, how you been? You know, that kind of thing. And one of them said something, something like, well, I've lost a few. I can tell you that. So I don't know what a few are, a few what, a few fights, a few pounds. I don't know. But like whatever it is, he's had a hard one. Okay, you know what I mean? And there was just like this sense that of like there was a steadiness. I didn't say much in the meeting. You know what I'm like? Whatever these guys have endured, it's been enough to produce steadiness. And there's just a connection sometimes between what you've suffered and how much gravity 
your, your character actually carries. I'm not saying suffering is the only way to get to steadfastness, but I'm telling you it's a way to push fast forward, for sure. Suffering has a way of just maturing people and putting a steadfastness in them, and you can feel the effects little by little. I'd like to claim, um, I know you're supposed to be careful where you think you stand, lest you fall, but I would like to say and report that through suffering, I've actually gotten just a little more patient and a little more steadfast. So um, here's my apartment um, presently. Um, that's my bedroom ceiling, and you'll note first that it's not there. Um, so that's not good. Um, so anyway, so if we had water leaks, and when there's water leaks, when we fix the roof, and uh, we still have water leaks, which is not supposed to happen again. I'm like, it's, this is a roof. Like, we put a man on the moon. Like, how come we can't fix the roof? So anyway, um, so anyway, that's there. But if you zoom in, you're like, what's that blue stuff? What is that? Is that like insulation? No, that's the enemy. That's mold. So, so then we got to move out. So now we got all our stuff in the living room, We're like sleeping in the living room. I got like trash bags, like covering my door. Like it's condemned. We can't breathe that air, you know? So anyway, I like at this point, like this happens, I think Wednesday of this last week. And my wife is at work and the kid was at daycare. And I'm like, you know, I'm like dealing with the enemy. And so I'm, I just, you know what I did? I'm like, okay, I got two options here. I can freak out or I can grab my guitar and go to a room that doesn't have mold and just play worship songs. And so I freaked out. I'm kidding. I grabbed my guitar. I grabbed my guitar and I just went in there and I'm just like, I'm just going to pray and I'm just going to worship God. You know what? There's bigger problems in the world. Like it's going to be okay. And just somehow stayed grounded. Look, I'm not claiming that I'm never going to like lose my marbles again or freak out. That button is still there and I'm sure it'll get pushed eventually at some point. Okay. So I'm not professing to be fully delivered here. I'm just telling you 10 years ago, it's going to be a freak out. Like there's just no way that I'm going to have any sort of calm whatsoever. And the truth is the only reason why I felt any sort of steadfastness in that moment is not just a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit's maturation through suffering. I've been around, I've lived in New York City Metro now for five years. We've had leaky roofs. Did you know if it rains hard enough right here, okay, it can happen. All right, so, I mean, you've just been around enough things that go wrong and eventually you just hold things a little looser. All right, and it just depressurizes things and that is a feature of steadfastness. It can come to you. So, let me ask you this. Do you assume that suffering has come from the enemy to do a negative work in your life or do you assume that suffering has come, in part at least, from God to do a positive work in your life? A lot of times when suffering knocks on our door, we're like, it's here to do a negative work. But in reality, and, and you know what? Suffering can do that. I mean, there are forms of suffering where I'm like, hey, on the surface, that's bad. Like, I, there's no way to say that's not bad. But the bad thing has this miraculous capacity when it comes under the authority of God. The bad thing can somehow accomplish a good thing. And that is your own steadfastness and your ability to suffer and not act absolutely like lose your mind and lose your faith and all this. So if you notice a weak faith and you feel tested, don't take it as a bad sign that God's hand is off of you. Take it, that a good, take it as a good sign that God's hand is on you, helping you work out a weak faith muscle and just get a little more steadfast in understanding his control and his providence. Let's go back to James one final time. He says this, and let steadfastness, there's like a chain reaction now, and let steadfastness, once, you, once that's happened, so suffering and then steadfastness, then what? Let that have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's going to have a completing effect on you. What one commentator called a completeness of character. He's, what James is saying is, the suffering is going to complete you. The suffering, even if you feel like you're losing much, the suffering is going to complete you. Now, I know that when we hear words like perfect and complete, we are like kind of preset to hate perfectionism and the pressure that comes from it. And so when we hear words like perfect and complete, it kind of clangs in our ears like that's an impossible ideal. I, you know, I'm going to stress myself out. So sometimes we don't like the words perfect and complete because we know we can't get there on this side of heaven. So when James uses the word perfect, he does it five times in this letter. When he uses the word perfect, what he's got in mind is not that you're somehow as perfect as God is and you're, never, you're not still a perfect person in progress or whatever. He doesn't have that form in mind. He has in mind that nothing obvious is lacking. You know, you can have a lot of character traits, but still something obvious could be lacking. And steadfastness has this effect of like completing someone. 
You know what I mean? There, you can have great faith. You can serve a lot. You can give. You can love people. You can be a good neighbor, roommate, spouse, son, daughter, whatever. You can be a good lots of things, but still not have any steadfastness and be just kind of flighty and flaky. You know what I mean? And this steadiness, the steadfastness that comes from suffering has this way it can make sure you're not lacking anything. You know, it works like this. We're not saying total perfection. We're saying completion. You know, getting my two-year-old dressed is a process. There's, you know, the feet are kicking and there's opinions now. One-year-old, no opinions. Now we got opinions about everything. So like all the opinions are coming out. And then invariably, by the time I think we're done, I look back and I'm like, something's missing. Hair bow, ponytail, backpack, jacket, you know, one shoe, something is missing. And then we put that last thing on and go, hmm, okay, perfect. When I say that, I'm not saying she's a perfect child. We know better than that. We're saying nothing obvious is lacking. And that's the kind of mindset that James has got here. If you've got steadfastness, you will be complete in a sense that nothing obvious is lacking. So that means suffering can complete you. Suffering can complete you. Distinctly countercultural. You guys remember that rom com? You complete me. No, suffering will complete you, okay? Another human being cannot complete you, all right? Suffering and the steadfastness that it brings can complete you. You can have every Christian virtue, but if you don't have steadfastness, you won't be complete. And you can perhaps arrive through a close following of the Holy Spirit. You can perhaps arrive at steadfastness without suffering, but I do know that suffering will put you on the fast track to a steady spirit. And that's the, that's the case that James is making, so that you aren't lacking anything in your character. Let me show you something I call the character bucket. Here we go. It's an uninspiring sight. That's just a bucket. Um, it's made of wood. If you're on the podcast there and you have no idea what we're seeing, this would, be, um, this would be just a regular wooden bucket, maybe knee high, and it's made of vertical slats, you know, like vertical pieces of wood going around in a circle um, until it is a lot more watertight than my roof. So this is the character bucket. Now here's the thing. Imagine um, if one of those slats was lower than the others, just one. The, what would happen is the bucket would carry no more water than the highest slat. You don't have to lower the whole thing. You just lower one, and it won't carry that much water anymore. You see what I'm saying? So if one is missing, it carries zero water. If one is half missing, it carries half as much water. You only have to have one slat shaved down, and that is your new capacity for carrying water. Everything has got to be complete, or you will not be able to carry what you're designed to carry. This is a powerful principle um, for, for character, you know what I mean? Like if you go, if you commit a crime, you know, nobody, when it comes to character stuff, nobody grades on a curve, you know what I mean? Like there's no side credit. Here's what I mean. Like if you go to jail and you sit in front of the judge because you shot someone in the leg, okay? When you go to the judge, you're not gonna be able to say, I didn't shoot him in the other leg, you know what I mean? But it doesn't matter. You shot someone in the leg. You see what I'm saying? It, you can't do that. So there's a sense in which there's no points for side credit. And when it comes to character, it always works that way. There's a powerful lesson here for Christian leaders, okay? If a Christian pastor is kind of a manipulator and, you know, doesn't really tell the truth, it doesn't matter. It's not when he gets caught and, you know, everybody's like, hey, man, you're kind of a manipulating liar and, and have a bad effect on everybody around you. And you can't manage the truth faithfully, you know, and for some reason, the information always changes and you're always the victim and it just feels slippery. You're slippery. He can't say that nobody, you know, nobody's going to sit around and be like, but he was faithful to his wife and he didn't steal money. You know what I'm saying? Well, good. Well, good on you. But you also can't be a manipulative liar who, with, who's slippery with information. Do you see what I'm saying? There's no side credit. You get what I'm saying? So when it comes to your character, some of the best advice I've ever heard about character. When it comes to your character, work on your weaknesses. When it comes to your giftings, your talents, you know, your, your superstar talent or whatever, you can concentrate on your strengths there. Like if you have a great talent, you know, whether it has to do with business or music or whatever, or even the ways you build relationships, great. Use your strengths. When it comes to your, to your gifts and your talents, focus on your strengths. But when it comes to your character, Focus on your weaknesses because your weakest point of character is going to be the limitation of what God can, of the ways that God can use you in terms of influencing other people. So the character bucket's principle is this. If any part of your character is missing, any part of your character is missing, that is going to be the limitation of how much, of how much character you actually have. It will lower your total capacity, you know. Um, when I, <laughs> we, we spend weekly at our church, one of the features of our church life is, Everyone is in, everyone who calls this place home is in what's called a community group. And a community group is a group of three to nine 
men or three to nine women, and trust is built such as it's a high amount of like disclosure. You know, there's there's encouragement and confession and mutual knowledge of each other's lives, and you know, it's a it's it's a sizable commitment. We're not trying to hide that. And so, but there's a lot of life that comes from it. And you know, when I go and confess I've done something wrong, nobody ever comforts me with my successes in another area of life. You know, if I'm like, well, I was really argumentative with my wife and I just kind of raised my tone and my voice and I was just rude, to be honest. Nobody's like, but Garrett, your Sunday sermon was great. Like, they, they know better, okay? They know better. It doesn't matter if it was good or not. Like, there's no bleed over side credit when it comes to a character fault. So, what James is trying to say here is, I want you to be complete. I want you to be complete. Steadfast, a steadfast spirit is part of being complete. And suffering can actually help you get that steadfast spirit. That's where he opens the letter. We'll have to pick it up with him more next time, but let's close here. Will you, two questions, will you suffer? Maybe we should say, would you? Will you suffer for Christ? Are you willing to let suffering have its full effect on you? I know in a room this size, somebody in here, maybe multiple somebodies, are looking up at a mountain of suffering that you never wanted to have to climb, but you have no choice. Are you willing to see it, not just for its horrific effects, but are you willing to see it in the service of God, producing steadfastness? That is to say, are you willing to suffer for Christ in small or big ways, whether it is a loss of a family member or a relationship or the death of a dream or any sort of suffering as you define it, are you willing to let it do the work of God in your life? But here's the turn some of you didn't see coming on a suffering message. On the other hand, will you flourish for Christ? Because not everyone in this room is suffering right now. Will you use your non-suffering season for Christ? That's even a bigger question sometimes. Will you flourish for Jesus Christ? You know, sometimes we fail to ask ourselves this question. And I know as Christians, we like want to self-examine a little bit and be like, um, would I, you know, go through something terrible for God? Like if somebody like was like, are you a Christian? And like life or death was on the line and it was that kind of a threat, you know, like would you die for Christ kind of a thing? And sometimes we want to imagine like, what would I do in that moment? And we put ourselves to a hypothetical test. Well, here's the thing. If you're thriving right now, I, you know, let's let go of that hypothetical for a second. If you're not there, I would just tend to say, okay, I think the Holy Spirit will show up and help you do whatever you need to do in the situation you're in. But if the situation you're in is that you're healthy and on a world scale, you know, got enough money and got enough friends and like everybody in the world would look at you like, hey, this is thriving. This is what it feels like. Might not be what you expected, but you're actually thriving right now. This is what thriving feels like. Will you use that for Christ? In other words, what I'm telling you is we spend too much time examining ourselves, would I die for Christ? And not enough time asking, will I live for Christ? Will I use my daily opportunity when I can breathe and walk around and I have chances and like this is, this is the window of flourishing. I'm not suffering yet or I'm not suffering anymore. Now's the window of opportunity. You know, our church, I, I know good and well that we do have suffering here. I'm not looking past that. But I also know that just statistically speaking, just on account of sheer age, we don't have as much suffering as many others do. Just on account of where we live and how old we are and that kind of a thing. And I understand we've got a very diverse group here, very diverse experiences and needs and hardships and sufferings and all that. So I'm not trying to level the playing field totally. I'm just saying if you zoom out far enough, a group of, look at it, you're, just, you're so cool. Look at every one of you, you're just cool. I can just see it, it's just coming off of you. I can just see it, okay? So you are what thriving looks like, even if you don't feel like it. Will you thrive for Christ? If you've got suffering on and you can't get out of it, then ask yourself, will you suffer for Christ? But if that's not your season, just ask yourself, am I really using my window of thriving here? Will I live for him? It doesn't matter, you know, if you live for something else for 40 years, you know, and then at the tail end, you're like, well, I would, you know, I'd take a bullet for Christ. Well, would you live 40 years of well-being for him? Let's sign up for that if that's what he's calling us to do. So what I'd love to do right now is if we could just pray silently, just, just be in your, in your space. We moved around the room a lot as we prayed last week, and we do that sometimes. But on this one, if you'll just sit and reflect silently before God and just pray and just respond to him and just ask him, God, am I... 
am I suffering right now? And if you are, it won't take long for you to know it. It'll come to mind. And just ask God, God, will you help me see that this suffering even can accomplish a work of steadfastness in me that you are the author of? Make me complete as I suffer through X, Y, Z, A, B, C, who knows what. You fill in your blank, but just ask God, will you help me suffer? And if, you, if you're having to look too hard to come up with suffering, you should, you should just sit before God and ask him, God, will you help me thrive for you? Will you help me in the season when I'm well to be undistracted? Can you accomplish the miracle in me of doing fine in a global city, but somehow being focused on Christ, the king of the globe? God, will you help me thrive for you if I know good and well that things are on the up and up? Just be in his presence and just ask him. God, help me suffer through this diagnosis. God, help me suffer well and let let this hardship do its work. Help me understand what job loss is and that you're with me and that this can produce a steadfastness. God, help me suffer for you through immigration, documentation, problems, complications. God, help me suffer through loneliness in a way that even that bad thing can accomplish your work in me. Or God, help me thrive with the promotion I just got, the raise I just got, the broadened sense of opportunity that I just felt felt and received. Help me thrive as my dreams seem to be within my grasp. Just make it about you somehow. Don't let the world drag me off and distract me. Lord, you and you alone can get your arms around the entirety of human experience. But you've made sure there's always a path to you. Help us take it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us. If these messages are strengthening you in your faith, we want to hear from you. Find us online at missioncity.nyc or email us at info at missioncity.nyc so we can celebrate everything God's doing in your life. We'll see you next week.